So welcome to another laboratory video for chemistry. We're gonna be determining the percentage of water in a hydrated ionic compound today. We're gonna to be using a pretty common hydrated salt of copper sulfate, copper two sulfate. It's a blue colored salt. I've got some in a plastic vial here. We're gonna be heating that salt to drive off the water of hydration that's in the salt crystals and we'll be left with anhydrous salt once the water is gone. We're gonna be using porcelain little dishes referred to as crucibles. Um, I've checked my crucibles, made sure they're clean and dry. We've also checked them for cracks. We, if you see a little crack in the crucible, it's made of porcelain. You wanna to check to see if the crack continues on the outside and inside. If that happens, you'll put it aside because during the heating that could break. If you see a small crack in the porcelain, but it's not on the other side, then it's probably fine to use. So I've got two crucibles here. Let's start by recording their masses. So you can record the mass of the first crucible. Now I'm gonna take some of my copper sulfate salt. I'm gonna add that to the crucible and you're gonna record the mass of the salt after I've added it. All right, so that should be good. So you wanna record that mass of the crucible with the hydrated salt. So just again, the hydrated salt we're using, copper sulfate um, is a blue colored salt. Okay, when it's hydrated, it's a blue color. So there's our first crucible. Let's do the same thing with a second sample. So record for yourself the mass of a second crucible. Notice, although they may look similar, they're not exactly the same. So always record the masses. And now let's add some salt to this. Okay, so I'm, yeah, the exact amount isn't that important, but you want more than two grams or so. <clears throat> okay, so record the mass of the second crucible with its copper sulfate salt. Now I've got support stands set up with small micro Bunsen burners. There are rings attached, and we're using what's called a clay triangle. The clay triangle is just wire with clay um, little rings to it. That's gonna hold the crucible. The clay tri triangles are flexible, so if the crucible sits on top and it's a little bit wobbly, like it might fall off, you can widen the clay triangle so it sits lower down or if it's so wide that the crucible is in danger of falling through, you can squeeze the clay triangle closer to make it a little bit tighter fit. So that's a good fit. The crucible's not gonna fall off of there. There's a second one that's also a good fit. Now, as we heat the, the salt, the water of hydration is going to escape and come out to the air, but it is possible that there could be some spitting of the salt. So we're gonna cover the crucibles with lids, but not completely. You don't wanna cover it completely because we do want the water to escape from the crucible during the heating. So notice I'm leaving a bit of a gap for the water to escape. I'll put the other lid there, again, leaving a small gap. And now we're ready to start heating. So I've got the two micro burners. Let's light them, we'll turn the gas on. Light the first burner and light the second burner. All right, so I've got the crucibles positioned so they're near the top of the burner flames and we're using micro burners, not the larger burners. I wanna heat relatively slowly. I'm trying to not melt or, or decompose the hydrated salt. I want simply the water of hydration, which is loosely held within the crystal structure, to escape. So we're gonna let them heat for about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll come back and we'll reset. All right, so I've just come back after about six or seven minutes of heating and I've turned off one of the burners because I'm not sure if you can see it, there's a little bit of evidence of some smoke coming out of the crucible. So it's possible that even though I had it pretty high up in the flame, 
that it is actually starting to decompose the copper sulfate salt. If that's occurring, then more than water would be escaping. So keep that in mind in the first sample, that it's possible that it partially decomposed, which means that it will appear as though more water has escaped than it should have. So just keep that in mind. Now I'm gonna keep heating the other one because it's got a bit of a, a gentler flame. So that one's I'm gonna keep going. Now, since I've stopped heating, I'm gonna take my crucible tongs because that crucible is extremely hot. And I'm gonna take the lid off. So I'm gonna grasp the edge of the lid. This one I'm holding upside down. You can see some of that smoke coming off. I'm gonna put that on the base of the metal support stand. I don't wanna put it on the tabletop because it'll burn the tabletop. Now I've got the crucible here. Let me grasp it and bring that for you to see. You can see inside the crucible that it's no longer a blue colored salt. It's a white colored salt. And I don't see much evidence in there of any other color change than white. So possibly that the, if there was some decomposition that we may be lucky and it may not be that significant. The anhydrous version of the salt, the salt when it's lost its water in this example, is a white salt. So it started off blue when it was hydrated, and then when it's anhydrous, when there's no more water, it looks white. So I think I might be okay. Now, not all salts will have that kind of color change when you turn the hydrated version to the anhydrous version, but in this example, you do see that color change. So we've been heating the second salt over there, our second sample, for about seven or eight minutes now. I think I'm gonna let it go for another minute. I'll stop and I'll do the same thing with that crucible as well. We have to wait for them to cool before we can weigh them. All right, so I let the second sample heat for an extra minute or so. And so the first sample has been out cooling for a couple of minutes. I've got here a jar referred to as a desiccator. The desiccator is a heavy walled jar. It's got this heavy lid on it. The lid is attached to the bottom with some grease. So I've got to slide the lid off and then pull it off. So it's, a t it's got petroleum jelly around there. So let me just put the lid down over here for a moment. Now inside that jar, there's a porcelain dish and you can see it's got three holes to hold three crucibles. These crucibles are a bit larger, so I've got to be a bit more careful. Um, and then in the bottom of the desiccator, there's these what look like little stones. The, that is an anhydrous salt. So that's an anhydrous salt which would absorb water from air and become hydrated again. So that process where an anhydrous salt absorbs water from the air to rehydrate, that could happen to the salt in our crucibles. Now I'm in Winnipeg in the middle of winter and the air around us is actually quite dry. So I'm not overly concerned with that happening, but just as a precaution, I'm gonna take my crucible number two, I'll put it in first, and then I'm gonna grab the crucible number one, put it in second. Now these crucibles are a little bit too big for this desiccator. So I'm gonna put it in carefully. And then I'm gonna put the lid on top and slide that lid to make a tight seal. So now inside the desiccator, if there is any water vapor in the air, it's being absorbed by the anhydrous salt at the bottom. So the air inside the desiccator should be much drier than the air out here. As I said, this is February in Winnipeg. The air in the room is actually not very humid at all. So this might not be necessary. So we're gonna let them cool inside the desiccator and then we'll weigh them again. So the crucibles have been cooling inside our desiccator for about five minutes or so. Remember the first crucible had an extra minute or two to cool as well. So I'm gonna take the lid off. I slide the lid till it loosens, take the lid of the desiccator off. Now, you've been heating that crucible and you don't wanna just grab it, could it could still be quite hot. So you put your hand, the palm of your hand near the crucible. I don't feel any heat coming off. So then I gently try to lift it. I can hold it like this in my hand. 
hold it over the palm of your hand like that. If you can hold it comfortably, this one is just slightly warm, I can hold it comfortably, then you can weigh it. So I'm ready to weigh this crucible. I've got my balance again. Remember, this is our first sample. So let's put that on the balance and you can record for yourself the mass of the crucible after the heating. All right, now you don't wanna weigh a hot crucible for two reasons. Number one, when it's hot, you could damage the electronic balance. So don't put hot objects on electronic balances. But secondly, a hot object warms the air around it as well, and that warm air rises. The warm air rising lifts the object, gives it some buoyancy, and that could affect your mass reading. For a heavy object, that's a very small error, but for light objects, that could be significant. So let's check the second sample. I don't feel any heat coming off, so I'm gonna gently grab the top, put it over my palm of my hand, don't feel heat, so I'll put it in the hand. It's a little bit warmer than the first, and a little bit less time to cool, but I think that's quite easily comfortable. I can weigh that. Now you might notice I touched a little bit of the edges of the uh, desiccator. There was a little bit of that petroleum jelly, so I wanna be sure I don't get any of that on the outside of my crucible, or that would affect its mass. So there's the mass of the second sample after heating. Now, how do we know that we drove off all of the water from the hydrated salt? If we look at the salt inside the crucible, it does look white. So from the surface, it appears that all of the salt, is, all of the water is gone, but maybe underneath, there's still some of the blue salt at the bottom. So what I'm gonna do is reheat the samples I'm gonna put them back on their clay triangles. I'm gonna heat them again for another, oh, three or four minutes, and then we'll cool them again, and we'll see if the mass changed. If the mass after the second heating is essentially the same as the mass after the first heating, then we know we were actually done after the first heating. If the mass drops again significantly after a second heating, then there would still have been water present. We would then need to do a third heating. We would keep that process of heating, cooling, and massing until the masses stayed constant or essentially constant. So I'm gonna reset, we'll reheat these for a few minutes, we'll cool them, and we'll mass them again. All right, so it's been several minutes. I've finished heating the two samples and I've got them cooling in our desiccator. Let's see if they're ready to be masked. So I'll take the lid off, being careful not to touch the crucibles because of that petroleum jelly that's on the lid. I put my hand near, I don't feel too much heat, so I'm gonna gently lift the first crucible. Okay, I can hold it comfortably, it's a little warm. I'll put it over my hand, I don't feel heat. I think I can mask that. So here's our first sample after the second heating and cooling. Okay, so record the mass after the second heating and cooling. I'm just comparing it to the last trial and I notice it's pretty much the same, which means that we had actually successfully driven off all of the water initially. So now the second sample, okay, I can lift it up, put it over the palm of my hand, it's definitely hotter out, it's a little bit warm, but I think I can still go ahead and, and weigh it. So I'm gonna put that on the balance and you can record the mass after the second heating. And I notice that it's also pretty much the same. So both of them were heated for about four or five minutes extra. I stopped heating because there was a little bit smoke coming out of the first uh, crucible. So again, that smoke could mean that we were decomposing it. Now I've got my first crucible here and I'm gonna show you something before we finish. So there's the white salt, the anhydrous um, copper sulfate after we drove off the water. Now to drive off the water, we needed to heat it. So driving off the water, turning it from the hydrated salt to the anhydrous salt 
must have been an endothermic process. It absorbed heat from the burner flame to do that. I'm gonna take some distilled water. I've got a bottle of distilled water here. I'm gonna put some distilled water into the crucible and I want you to make at least two observations as I add the water back to the anhydrous salt. So see if you can make two observations. Okay, now one of those observations should be more obvious than the other, but I think you probably detected both of them. Let me do it again with the second crucible. So here's our second sample. Again, it's got the white anhydrous salt. Let's add some distilled water and observe two things that occur when water is reintroduced. Okay. I can hear something as well as see things. All right, so I hope you were able to detect two different observations as I added water back to the anhydrous salt, and you can think about why those two observations occurred. All right, so you now have enough data to calculate the mass of the hydrated salt samples that we used, you can also calculate the mass of water that escaped during the heating, and you can also calculate the percentage of water in the hydrated samples, and that's the goal of our experiment, to calculate the percentage of water that was in the copper-2-sulfate hydrated salt. So good luck with your calculations.